please welcome to the Museum of Flight, Mindy Johnson and Willie Ito. Thank you. Thank you. Well, hopefully we're live, you can hear me. Well, it's a great joy, I know, for me to be here. I have family and, and a friend, dear friends up in the area, and it was always an adventure to travel with this amazing gentleman, longtime friend and amazing artist. So we have a lot of wonderful ground to cover um, here this afternoon, and we're so delighted you could come out on a kind of a somewhat soggy day and, and spend time here in the warm, wonderful confines here of the museum to explore this wonderful story. Well, the idea of animation, we think of the nine old men of Walt Disney and Walt Disney and Chuck Jones and these great leaders of animation. It's a real delight for me as an historian to lift a little, little bit on the art of animation and cast a light on some of the artists who never really got too much exposure during their, their day, but now we find we've got these wonderful treasures here. And the art of animation is a very diverse, very progressive art form. Um, today we are finally realizing that we live in a very rich and diverse culture and community in this country. It's a fortunate, wonderful thing that we are able to do. And the art form of animation has also enjoyed a very rich, diverse group of artists. It really is about your artistry and your talent, not about your hair color or shoe size. And particularly within the Asian community, we have a lot of really remarkable artists. Bob Kurahara, here we've got a few behind us. Gyo Fujikawa, you may have read about some of these artists in the wonderful exhibition. Um, Gyo is also quite significant. There's a terrific uh, section there about her featuring her work. But she was also a pioneering illustrator. Uh, after the war, she remained in New York and began writing and illustrating her own children's books. She fought for the ability for illustrators to have royalties. That was not practice in the industry. It was Gyo Fujikawa who broke ground. So those of you who are future illustrators or who perhaps illustrate today and enjoy receiving royalties from your illustrations, you have Gyo Fujikawa to thank for that. She also designed stamps for a couple of the uh, national uh, awards of beautification of America campaign. She was honored by multiple presidents. Uh, Benny Nabori also worked at Disney Studios, was interned at Topaz Mountain. We'll talk more about him. Uh, Mike Kawaguchi, uh, Chris Ishii, Tom Inata, James Tanaka, Jimmy Murakami, and so many more uh, additional Japanese artists. We also had a number of Chinese artists, Tyrus Wong, Cy Young, who led the special effects department at the Walt Disney Company on Snow White, The Seven Dwarfs, and many other films as early as the 1930s. Um, that department was run by Cy Young. And the great, the great Tyrus Wong was a dear friend who uh, defined the look for Bambi, the suggestion of the forest when you see his beautiful, gorgeous renderings. He went on to an incredible career in live action film after his years at Disney. But more contemporary artists as well, Iwo Takamoto as Kale mentioned, who was an, a mentor to you. We'll talk more about him, Kimi Tashimi, and Mishi Kateoka, uh, other remarkable artists, um, Tad Moshinaga, Ichiro Kamura, Kyoko Kita, a lot of really powerhouse, talented artists throughout the animation industry, all throughout. But I think what's important as we begin this conversation, as we explore the, the uh, unique experiences you had growing up, Willie, just to get a little bit of sense of background, um, to understand what was happening in the world right prior to uh, the war. Uh, when we look at, at about 1934, there was a strong uh, influx of Japanese immigration here in the United States, and, and they really embraced Western culture and lifestyles, and were also expanding more Western understanding of a global sense of culture, bringing their own art 
music, sciences, and education, which really enriched and enhanced things, uh, particularly in the early 19 to mid 1930s. Then in 1941, as we have the bombing of Pearl Harbor, it, literally overnight, mm -hmm. everything changed virtually. 120,000 Japanese Americans were rounded up for incarceration. All property was seized. Uh, bank accounts were frozen. And 1,862 people died from medical problems. One out of 10 of the people incarcerated uh, developed tuberculosis because of the conditions. It was horrific. It's a, a sad part of our history. Um, by 1945, with the end of the war, Japanese Americans were released from incarceration. Again, it was a very staggered release. We'll talk more about that. Again, the property and bank accounts generally were not returned. Nothing really officially was returned. So it's important to understand uh, this sense of, of what was unfolding. Um, prevailing attitudes lingered as well, unfortunately. Uh, it was a very challenging time. And we still in many ways have to work our, our way out from that very limited time. December 7th again, 1941, transformed everyone's lives. And the U.S. became involved in World War II, which had been running, raging in Europe primarily at that point and in other theaters. And now uh, the U.S. was brought in. And to the point I mentioned, these prevailing attitudes, these are difficult images to see. Um, and sadly, comic artists like Milt Caniff and, and Theodore Geisel our beloved Dr. Seuss, were adding to this propaganda and this, these sort of very difficult uh, portrayals of a race. Um, so it's within that context. We, we need to place this to have an understanding of the reality of what you as a young man were growing up in. Now, Willie, you're originally from San Francisco. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And... You were the, your father was a musician and was learning the barber trade, a number of things. When you lived in a home in, in you experienced, grew up as a normal kid. You were influenced by a particular early film that came out. What, yeah. talk about that for a minute. <laughs> well, I was five years old and I was sitting in my neighborhood theater and on the big screen, in living technicolor, seven little men marched across the screen, <laughs> singing hi-ho, hi-ho, it's off to work we go. And I says, that's it. That's what I want to be. No, not one of the seven dwarfs, <laughs> but a cartoonist. And, and at that point, uh, even though I was still only five years old, this is this was my destiny. I you knew I, even then. I'm sorry. Yeah, you knew I, even I then. I knew at that time that cartooning is something I wanted to do, and um, so I um, fortunately I sort of excelled in art through grammar school and all that. So you know my teacher would hang up my. Uh, uh, paintings and stuff on the wall and I would get up a gold star and I was quite proud of my accomplishments. And then for the infamous day, December, December 7th. 7th came and um, I was on a picnic down in Santa Cruz, which is a resort town about two miles, I mean two hours south of San Francisco. And uh, my uncle, who had just graduated high school, he was courting his uh, girlfriend, which later became my aunt. So we were spending the day uh, at Santa Cruz. We did the roller coaster and, and the uh, bumper cars and whatever. Then we thought, 
well, let's go out to the beach now and spread out our blanket and had our nice lunch. And then around three o'clock, the fog rolled in and it started getting cold. So we thought, well, let's uh, roll up our blankets and go back to the city. As we approached the city limits of San Francisco, our military guards were stopping the cars, checking their ID. Now, I, when, when I kind of reflect back to then, I think the military was just stopping cars that had Asians in it to make sure that we belonged in San Francisco. So we passed the mustard and we proceeded into the city and practically every corner was newsboys saying, uh, you know, yelling extra, extra, read all about it. War, war. I had no idea what that word war meant, but I soon found out, you know. Yeah, and you were about how old again? Well, at that time, I was eight years old. We got home. My whole family was assembled at my home. My mother was in a complete tizzy because there was no way to reach my uncle to find out what was going on. And of course, in San Francisco, our the Japanese uh, community got the word and the whole community was just, we, we didn't know what to expect. Well, we come home, you know, oh, we had a good day at, in Santa Cruz and all that. And wow, where were you guys? See, remember, that was before cell phones. Yeah. <laughs> so there was no way to, you know, contact us. And, and then we soon found out, uh, you know, what was uh, so going down. Within a matter of days, Executive Order 9066 came about. Literally, uh, flyers began to appear stating that all Japanese uh, descendants, uh, uh, Japanese descendants, he needed to report. Now, what were you told? And, and your father did something rather, he had a good foresight, I think, in a lot of ways. He'd have made an arrangement with your neighbor? Well, see, in 1939, uh, my mother was uh, pregnant with uh, my sister. And so he decided it's time to um, buy a home. So he had just purchased a home. Uh, and um, so, you know, we were comfortable and we were living in it. And of course, uh, uh, when this happened, the orders was to just relinquish everything. Bank accounts are frozen, sell off whatever you have because we're going to be incarcerated into, at that time, we referred to it as concentration camps. Mm -hmm. And literally it was because we were surrounded with barbed wire fences and we had guard towers with armed military personnel with the guns pointed in. Yeah. And so, so it was wow, not a, not that a was something. environment. And, but prior to that, your father made arrangements with a neighbor. Yes. Well, yeah, uh, my father had a very close uh, Chinese family friend. And uh, so he uh, he asked them if him and his family might like to um, move into our home and and, uh, you know, just take care of it and do whatever, not anticipating what may become of us. Fortunately, because of that move, we had a home to come back to. Yeah. Very but few meanwhile, did. Yeah. Very few did, yeah. The rest of the um, uh, Japanese community returning home had to, they had no home, so, but they came back to the uh, enclave, the uh, Japantown enclave. So at the church, gymnasium, the YMCA, the yeah. churches, whatever, they had cots laid out for all of these people coming home to no home and uh, so so overnight virtually you had to pull together what little you could yes. and leave everything else behind and 
you were rallied together, put on trains, is that correct? Or yeah, you, well... And your first place was just outside Yeah, of, right outside of San Francisco, we had a racing... Uh, track. Uh, the, track, so. race track, uh, called Tamferan. And so that was basically where we were sent to first. And many of the early arrivals literally had to live in horse stables. Yeah. So can you imagine living where the where the floor was mud packed with manure? And hay. And, and hay. Dust. And, and um, spider webs all over and whatever. And so they would be ushered into the um, uh, stable and the beds were folded cots leaning against the wall. So I said, well, here's your beds. And then he would ask, well, where's the mattresses? He said, see that pile of hay outside? Well, here's some white bags. Fill that up, and then that's your mattress. If you had allergies, God, <laughs> it, was, it was terrible. Fortunately, we, um, they were building barracks in the midfield of the uh, racing track. So uh, many of us were able to actually uh, move into the barracks. And, uh, but this was San Francisco Bay Area. The climate is, uh, you know, mild. We didn't have hot summers and we didn't have snow or whatever during the winters. So it was comfortable. Mm -hmm. But yeah. when we were... You were relocated. Relocated time. to our uh, permanent camps in the Midwest, in the middle of the deserts. And so all 10 camps... I, I think the uh, people that plan these camps got together and says, where is the most miserable area we could send these guys to? And so consequently, I was in the middle of the Utah desert, uh, which at one point used to be the Great Salt Lake. And as the Great Salt Lake shrank, uh, it was desert land and the uh, dirt was alkali dust. And uh, that the wind would blow that thing around, and sagebrush would tumble weeds, and oh. So they were barbed wired. Yeah. You were you were in contained within was, a certain radius. Um, it, they were essentially tar, tar paper shacks. Yes. Yeah. You were given a small little furnace inside, if that. Yeah, we had what we call the old uh, pot belly stoves yeah. that we would burn coal. And so on the day that the coals were delivered, it was every man for himself yeah. rushing to the coal pit and filling their buckets with uh, choice pieces of coal. And, mm -hmm. and if you were late, you just had the dust to, to burn. It, it was, um, uh, you know, I, it was Heroin. quite, quite yeah. an experience. And this was for, it took a few Several weeks before you were relocated there, this is where you ended up. Yeah, this is where. Um, now, lots of kids, all ages. As I mentioned, there were thousands who died. Tuberculosis was rampant. Um, this is Topaz, where you, the image behind us here, is the camp that you were located to. Um, there are facilities. It was sort of communal dining. Dining communal being dining. a very... <laughs> And bathrooms with no stalls. Yeah. It was just open bodies. Yeah. And so the uh, ladies uh, eventually made uh, curtains that they could hang between uh, urinals or potties and whatever. And uh, <laughs> it was it was quite a change from you know growing up and living in a in a nice uh, city atmosphere. Right. You know. Now, as a young boy, you were about eight, as you said, when you first were relocated. And it was about three years, three and a half years, yeah, roughly. Yeah, it was a three-year internment. Yeah. yeah. And now, you've, you and I have talked about this uh, uh, quite a bit. And for a young boy, this was 
there was a bit of an adventure to this, it was. right? <laughs> yeah, Talk we kind of that. looked at it as a, a great summer camp, you know. And um, like my riding partner, Shig, uh, he was very athletic. So he was outdoors uh, playing touch football and baseball and, and whatever else. But me, being uh, somewhat of a, a desk jockey, I would <laughs> sit indoors and droop. Now, because we didn't have a store in our camp, uh, we had to order everything through catalogs. And so every three months, Sears and Roebuck or Montgomery Ward would send new catalogs. They were thick and um, uh, they were like phone books, you know. It was the pre-Amazon. Yeah, pre-Amazon <laughs> days, of course. And so what I used to do is with the expired catalogs, I would take it and on the margins, I would draw characters, walking, bouncing ball, you know, all the usual thing. And I made my own little flip book. And I guess you might say that was my very early foray into the art of animation. Well, also in the camp, there was a newsletter that came around um, on a weekly basis thereabouts. And there was a particular comic that would appear yeah, of course, before we were incarcerated, you know, we would get the uh, Sunday papers. And back then, it was uh, the big sections of comic pages. And every Sunday morning, I would run downstairs and go to the front door and retrieve the uh, San Francisco Chronicle and the uh, Examiner and just uh, lock myself into all these great comics. While we were incarcerated, we no longer had the, uh, 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 I guess, the comic things and all. Then one day, I happened to pick up our camp newsletter, which was mimeograph. Ah, you guys don't even remember <laughs> mimeograph machines. But in it was a cartoon. The character's name was Janky. And um, Benny Naburi was the uh, artist, young artist behind this. Series. Yeah, and I got all excited. I thought, oh my God, here's a comic strip that's uh, being published, and it's being done by a fellow Japanese American cartoonist. Then, when I found out that he actually worked for Walt Disney Studio mm -hmm. before the war, that got me more jazz. So I was an ardent follower of the janky comic strip. And then one, one uh, Friday when the paper came out, no janky. And then I found out later that he was transferred, him and his family, to Heart Mountain, Wyoming, where he continued doing a comic strip for there. their newsletter. And then eventually uh, he signed up and served um, towards the latter part of the internment. He and a number of other interned uh, artists and other uh, Japanese American gentlemen signed up and served in military service towards the latter part. He ended up in New York after the war working in yeah. famous studios. A lot of the uh, Japanese artists uh, from the West Coast they had nothing to come back to. Oh. They no longer had their homes and whatever. And so rather than try to resettle here, they just figured, well, let's change our scenery. And they migrated back to New York. And of course, New York was also a hub oh. of many animation studios, such as Max Fleischer, and Terry Toons, and whatever. So they were able to get uh, employment in the animation business. Now, one of the things that I have to mention is the animation business is colorblind. Mm -hmm. We're all hired on the basis of our abilities, our portfolio, 
and whatever. And then they'll look up and look at your face, but then they're, they're not even going to question your ethnicity. They just sign here. Uh, <laughs> you're hired, you know. And so um, that's basically why I always felt that my career in the animation business was so so wonderful I, actually uh, I did what I wanted to do and was never discriminated against uh, so you know it, it was, was based on your talent and your, yeah, your skills exactly, not yeah. your, your race yeah. not your gender not mm-hmm. your well gender we could talk there were a few things we had to build back but <laughs> animation is we're discovering <laughs> that more women were there um, but now Another little side before we leave your internment experiences, uh, as a young boy and the impact of Snow White and Seven Dwarfs, you were able to pick out a particular toy, weren't you? (laughs) Yeah, after I saw Snow White for the first time and got so excited, we later went to our neighborhood Woolworth Five and Dime store where we traditionally would have... uh, hot dog and a milkshake or something after the movies. And then we would walk around the store and I saw this little bank, a dopey bank. And I just, you know, I just finished falling in love with dopey. So I said, can, can I can I have that? And so of course my dad bought it for me and I brought it home and Put it on my dresser in my bedroom, and every every night when I went to sleep, I says, "Good night, Dopey." And then in the morning, wake up and say, "Oh, you know, good morning, Dopey." And so that that Dopey has been with me for like eighty four years. Well, <laughs> and as you had is to leave, it? there the, it yeah. is. Yeah, but as you had to leave for the internment. The bank had to be left behind. Yeah, well, here's the story. (laughs) I came home from school one day, and sitting in the living room was my mother and father looking very ashen and pale. And I, and then first of all, my father's home, and it was during the weekday. And so I'm thinking to myself, gee, I wonder what's going on. Then I realized, there were two great big uh, FBI agents in a trench coat, just like a Humphrey Bogart movie, wearing a fedora hat and looking very stoic. And they were going through all of our belongings looking for contrabands, cameras, swords, uh, guns, weapons, even books. Uh, that were printed in in the Japanese language was being thrown into the hopper. And of course, one of the most sorry loss was when my father came back from uh, Hiroshima, he brought his family heirloom of this samurai katana sword. And of course, you know, the FBI agents, oh, you know, You'll you'll get it back, uh, but we never got any receipts or anything. So that was a big loss as far as the family heirloom. I'm sure it's in someone's collection today, (laughs) but not ours. Would have been deemed a weapon and and not been able to be kept. But you had to leave your bank. Yeah, so then after they left, hauling this big, big sack full of our treasures, I thought, oh my gosh, my my dopey bank. So I ran upstairs to the bedroom and much to my relief, dopey was still sitting there, you know. So of course, when we got orders to uh, be sent to camp, you could only take what you could carry with two hands. So of course, Frivolous things like a dopey bank had to be left behind to make room for my underwear. But uh, <laughs> uh, when we had to be practical, yeah, we got to be practical. <laughs> but 
Upon returning, and because of Willie's father's foresight, the home was still intact. Yes. Uh, you were able to return to your home, the yes. family home. And what else was awaiting? <laughs> well, I ran upstairs to the bedroom, and sitting in, on my dresser was a dopey bank. <laughs> And so I've had that dopey bank with me for all these years. You still have it, yeah. And it's still in, uh, I, I guess you would say, mint condition. Mm -hmm. The only thing that was missing was all the pennies that I had to put <laughs> into the bank. <laughs> but outside of that, you know. It's a small price to pay to keep <laughs> that, right? Well, here is Willie in his heyday. Um, you were a, a handsome young lad. You had finished your art training, and you got a call, a, a tip about making your way down to, to uh, Southern California. Um, now, you had an opportunity to go to Disney Studios and road test your portfolio. You were at Chenard Art Institute studying. Yeah. Bring, yeah. Take us from that point. You you got an opportunity to go into the studio. What happened? Yeah, basically, I was not seriously looking for employment at Disney Studios <laughs> because I was a student and I still had four years to go uh, at Chouinard's Art Institute. But I thought, hey, you know, what the heck? I've got my portfolio with me students work you know it was like high school junior high thing and so i'm thinking well i'm going to use this as a ticket to see the inside of the disney studio so i call and the personnel manager says come on in make me an appointment and so i go trudging onto the walt disney studio lot the month of June, around four o'clock in the afternoon, and I swear it must have been about 97 degrees in Burbank, but I'm wearing my San Francisco vest, my, my <laughs> wool uh, suit, wool <laughs> sport coat, tweed, slacks, even my necktie was all uh, tweed and whatever. It was hot. And I'm lugging this student portfolio onto the lot, and I'm just breaking out in perspiration. And then I finally make it to the main animation building, and, and I'm seeing all of these familiar things that I've seen in books and in movies about the Disney studio. And I'm thinking, well, there's that famous street sign, Mickey Avenue, Dopey Drive. And then the big building, that's just animation. And I thought, oh, I'm in Mecca, you know. And so I walk into the uh, building. Boom! I'm hit by this great refrigerated air conditioning. <laughs> and I thought, oh, my goodness. So I make my way down to the middle of the uh, floor, set of uh, elevators there, and Press the button. Swings open. I step in and I say, oh yeah, personnel is on the floor. So I press four. And then the door's closing. Then suddenly it opens. Standing be before me was Walt Disney. <laughs> he was with another gentleman and they were in a deep conversation. But as they stepped in, Walt looked at me, hovering uh, or cowering in the corner <laughs> of the elevator, and he gave me a polite nod, and then they both turned around, and I'm looking at the back of Walt's head, <laughs> thinking, oh my God, literally, oh my God, my kamisama. <laughs> Oh, wow. So um, uh, I have to say that was the longest four flights <laughs> of the elevator. And then finally we get up to the fourth floor and the door swings open and Walt and the gentleman, they continue their conversation and they go scream, right? And I go to personnel. Should I continue? 
Yes, you're on a roll. <laughs> well, now I have to mention, first of all, I grew up in San Francisco's Japan town, as we used to call it, Nihonmachi. And so, you know, my family, my friends, the, the whole enclave is a Japanese community. So outside of my going to school, you know, um, my whole life is within my Japanese community. And then, of course, three years incarcerated, nothing but Japanese, you know. So that was my whole thing, you know. I'm, uh, uh, I, uh, so when it came time to come down to Los Angeles and to attend uh, art school, I was quite intimidated because I thought, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm leaving the comfort of my community. And I didn't know what to expect. And I'm, I'm looking at Hollywood as the big white wave of you know, big studios and executives and all that. And so it was quite intimidating. And so walking onto the Disney studio, you know, I, I was excited but totally intimidated. And so after, uh, well, when I arrived, the uh, uh, personnel manager got on the intercom and two gentlemen walked in. And one was a big, tall, heavy set Caucasian uh, man who was the production manager. And then following behind him was this little Asian guy just like droopy dog. <laughs> and he had this um, uh, kind of a intimidating face, as we would say in Japanese, kurushi face. <laughs> and so, but I was kind of surprised because when I was introduced, uh, the uh, production manager said, I'd like you to meet uh, Iwo Takamoto. And I said, oh, God. I'm thinking to my oh, Takamoto, he's Japanese. And so uh, a after we were introduced, he, he softened up and we had a nice conversation. And then they took my portfolio into the conference room, but asked me to stay in the reception area. And I waited. And in about 20 minutes, Ken Seeming, the uh, personnel guy came out and said, well, thank you. They handed me my portfolio. Thank you for coming in. Uh, we'll, uh, don't call us. We'll call <laughs> you. And I said, well, that's fine. I'm thinking to myself, I got four years of schooling at Chenard's. I'm going to make up a super portfolio and then I shall return. And so, you know, I was happy that I was able to see the inside of the studio. I took my sweet time leaving the studio because <laughs> they had beautiful original from Snow White and Pinocchio on the walls. And I just, mm -hmm. I just took it all in. And then I, I promised myself, yes, you know, in four years, I will uh, make my... Uh, serious attempt to become an animator. But two weeks later, I came home from my night class and there was a Western Union telegram stuck on my door. And you know, back in the 50s, a Western <laughs> Union telegram either meant good news or bad news. And being away from home, it was a little scary. So, I took the uh, telegram, sat on my bed, and carefully opened it, and then read it, and now on the top it says, Walt Disney Productions. And then as I read, it, it, it was from Ken Sealing, inviting me to come on the following Monday to the studio and take a test, which I did. <laughs> now, that was the beginning of quite a career. You um, you started the studio when you were visiting Pinocchio, or Peter Pan had been 
uh, in production and, and then launched. It was a big success. But then they were moving into production of an original story idea involving a couple of dogs, and you were brought in on a particular unit. As a matter of fact, Iwo Takamoto, who reviewed my portfolio, turned out to be responsible for giving the uh, green light to hire me. And years later, when we worked together at Hanna-Barbera, I said, Iwo, you looked at my portfolio. I wouldn't have hired myself <laughs> with that portfolio. And he said, yeah, well, uh, because I could see the potential. Yeah. So anyhow, after I took my test at the Disney studio, I came back after lunch and the production manager came by and said, well, congratulations, you're hired. And I thought, wow, you know, that, that was really a big shock. Then he says, yeah, and we're going to start you in the lady unit. Well, I had no idea. <laughs> because, see, back then we had a department called inking and painting department made up of nothing but ladies. So I thought, well, maybe that's the, uh, uh, you know, apprenticeship or intern level starting in ink and paint, mixing paints and washing brushes or whatever. They well, were it turned master out to be. Huh? They, there were master artists in that department. Oh, too. yeah, <laughs> of course. And so when they said, Lady, uh, the production manager said, Well, go down D Wing and go to the end of uh, Milk Call's office, and the fellow that's in there with him will start you, you know. So I go down the hall, knock on the door, and of course, Milk Call is one of the one nine, of the nine old, old men. men. Yeah. One of the very famous Disney animators. He's been considered the Michelangelo of animation. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. New stuff. So I knock on the door, come in, I open the door, and sitting right by the door was Iwo Takamoto. So he says, yeah, well, it, well I'm going to get you started. And then he handed me a couple of joints, and it turned out to be a close-up of lady with this eyelashes and real sweet face and all. And then he proceeded to show me how in-betweens are made and all that. Well, it turned out to be the iconic spaghetti kissing scene from Lady in the Trap. So that's how I started my career. Not bad <laughs> for his first assignment, right? <laughs> and that scene is considered one of the all-time great classic kissing scenes on uh, in Hollywood. Um, usually if they, Valentine's Day, you see it featured yeah, quite a bit yeah, too. <laughs> um, but it is how you started. Not a bad start, young man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now production on this film went for a few years, about a couple of years. Well, by the time I came aboard, it was really coming towards the end and they were doing a lot of um, extra fixes and, and um, finalizing uh, animation and prior that. to yeah so uh, Sleeping Beauty was still being developed yeah. in, in early stages of animation so we, when we completed Lady in the Trap they, they asked uh, all of us new guys uh, to maybe take uh, three months off before Sleeping Beauty was ready for our uh, department. So I, I um, they, well, the day I got the notice that morning, I went right to the phone and called the Warner Brothers cartoons, and uh, they says, come on in Monday morning, and so, which I did. So I never really lost any time and while I was at Warner Brothers, the fortunate thing is because I had that Disney training, mm -hmm. I was able to, you know, move up. Step right down. in. Yeah. There weren't schools to teach animation at this point. And it's important to understand that you were really at the forefront, a pioneer in many, like, personality, expanding where personality animation continued. Uh, yes. Yeah. The Chuck Jones uh, experiences, the classic characters you worked on, you know, 
WhatsApp or Duck what, and, and one, uh, froggy one Froggy Evening, evening and uh, I mean, keep going. The list keeps yeah, going and here. And of course, the uh, Coyote and Road on the yeah. series and Pippi Lippie and Daffy Duck and all that. You know. They were groundbreaking. The characters had been around a while, but Chuck Jones really pushed the gr- sort of pushed the, the edges. Um kind of like a mock to <laughs> you know looking for speed in aviation these were the were the artists who were pushing boundaries in aviation and what characterizations could do oh yeah and then of course we had a, a master voice man uh, mel blank who was and doing great all the voices june foray as well <laughs> but mel didn't want june on the credit isn't that sad this is voice characterization Mel, Mel Blank. Got it. Hey Mel, did you do, uh, you know, witch the, hazel? Uh, witch hazel? <laughs> e- it was June Bray. <laughs> so Mel got all the credit. June did not. June was a landmark voice artist. You've all heard her voice uh, for decades, for generations. But it was Chuck who later redeemed himself by stating that. Um, June Frey was not the female Mel Blanc. Mel Blanc was the male June Frey. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, got to get that accurate. But what classic? Well, there was one voice that was uh, uh, not June nor Mel Blanc. True. There was a background artist named Paul Julian who uh, was painting a lot of backgrounds. And then, of course, some of the backgrounds are long. and uh, you know, So, he had a pile that he was carrying to the camera department. And we had a, you know, a rather narrow hallway with people passing constantly. So he would be carrying this and he would go, me, 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 me. <laughs> and Chuck was just developing the Coyote Roadrunner series. And he thought, hey, wait a minute. Hey, Paul, <laughs> come on in here. Did you just do that me, me? <clears throat> so, yeah, I, I, I need, needed to clear the way. He says, uh, let's, let's hear that again. So he did it. And then they made a tape of it. And that's how the Roadrunner got its. <laughs> You'd be surprised. There's a lot of uh, other <laughs> artists that get called in. The women from Inca Paint would get called in to do voiceover work. And little in idiosyncrasies and, and inflections that people did, mannerisms would show up in a lot of, of the animation as well. So inspiration from what's right around you was yeah. very prevalent, particularly at Chuck Jones. Now, beyond Warner Brothers, you were there for a number of years, and then you moved on to another little groundbreaking yeah. uh, animated adventure with the Bob Clampett Studios. Talk yeah, there was a little that. show that was on a local uh, network um, uh, in, in Los Angeles area, and it was a puppet show called Time for Beanie. And the characters are like Beanie and Cecil, and uh, you, you had people like... Uh, uh, Dolls Butler and um, uh, Sam Freeberg doing the voices and all. So Mattel bought the series as a cartoon show. And ABC was a network that also bought it. So while I was at uh, Warner Brothers, uh, I got a call from Bob Clampett Studio asking if I might be interested in coming over and transposing the puppet characters into animated characters. So that was my, uh, you might say, my very early stint in actually doing character designs. And uh, so that was a good, I guess you might say, uh, somewhat of a feather in my cap uh, for my career. Yeah, another really great classic quintessential character. Now, you were there? For a short while, and there was a fun zany Bob Clampett. What was he like to work with? He was quite zany. (laughs) Yes. And he was also known within the industry as, you know, one of the uh, kooky characters in as a director. So when I went to Chuck in Frizz Freeling and told them that I got this offer from Bob Clampett, (laughs) 
they were kind of rolling their eyes. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, one of the things that they told me was, now remember, Bob Clampett is doing television series. Yeah. We're a major studio, and we're going to be making cartoons like forever. <laughs> well, hello, uh, Warner, didn't just like MGM last. closed up, yeah, yeah didn't all quite the last. major studios uh, closed up. Well, and I think with Chuck's retirement and and it, it's transitioned quite a bit. Nothing yeah. lasts forever, uh, unless you're. We'll see yeah. where Disney goes these days. But you moved from there. Television. You, you were at the forefront of television animation, and Hanna Barbera quintessentially defined Saturday morning cartoons. We all grew up with Saturday morning cartoons, those of a certain generation. And you were right at the forefront of this. This was a sort of a brand new forum. Yeah. And yeah. Hanna-Barbera, Joe and Bill, they defined Saturday, which is still the staple today, right? It is, yeah. Um, so what was that like? It, you know, you were at Hanna Barbera fairly early on. Yeah, yeah. I I was fortunate to be one of the um, uh, oh. original. And you were part of some of the more landmark but groundbreaking series. Uh, everything from Jetsons, Scooby Doo, uh, Johnny Quest, many of the great Saturday morning classics, Flintstones. Yeah. Flintstones was landmark because it was prime time television. Prime time, supposedly yeah. for adults. Even had Winston Cigarette as yeah, a sponsor. Yeah, yeah. Kind of a honeymooners for, you know, so, you know, kind of really breaking ground in terms of uh, a different forum for animation. Yeah. And there were a lot of other series that you pioneered. Uh, and... Uh, Titles that had a level of diversity in them. The Harlem Globetrotters, Hong Kong Fui, mm -hmm. Charlie Chan and the Chan Clan. The first piece of animation, animated series to feature an all Asian cast, yeah. which is groundbreaking in going back to the 60s. That's a big deal today we marvel at. This gentleman was breaking ground decades prior. And of course the networks insisted at that time, that if you have any ethnic characters, it has to be voiced by an actor of that ethnicity. Mm -hmm. So the Harlem Globetrotter show was all black actors, and the uh, Chan Amazing Chan Clan had an all Asian uh, cast. You know, so let's take a look. I've got the trailer for the oh. Amazing Chan Clan. <laughs> This was a big deal. I remember when this debuted. I'm not that old, but I remember when this debuted. And I love the, the vehicle they drive here. They've got, you know, crime-finding family. <laughs> now, you developed this. You were producing, directing on this, animating. M more in the uh, conceptual. Conceptual stage. design of it, yeah. And of course, every crime fighting family has to have a band, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, we we would virtually rip off ourselves. <laughs> so you know, that's an Asian Scooby Doo. Exactly. And uh, of but course, it was pioneering television. Yeah. Then we we would rip off our own Flintstone many many times. <laughs> The Jetsons were the Flintstone in the future. It was a formula that worked, it, right? It worked. It worked, yeah. Families in, in and, and there was always a family construct to it as well. But these were fundamental things Saturday morning for generations of kids growing up. And I think particularly for young Asian children to see themselves on the screen for the first time yeah. and portrayed in, in something beyond stereotypical roles. Yeah, I. what amazes me is because I do a lot of um, speaking at comic cons and, and you know, comic uh, get-together type of things. And, um, you know, you had the baby boomers mm -hmm. and uh, that whole 
different generations that grew up with these cartoons. And I would be talking to someone that I'm thinking, this guy is kind of old, but he seems to know all about the Hanna-Barbera characters. And he would put us on the spot <laughs> because he would start asking questions about a particular show that I had credit on, so I should know about it. <laughs> but you got to remember the volume of shows yeah. that we were producing on a weekly basis. It's like you come in Monday morning, you sit down, you put a fresh piece of paper on your drawing board, and you put scene one. Then Friday, you're putting tape, and you put scene 250. Yeah. And then you turn that whole thing in, and then you forget about it. Then you go home Saturday morning. <laughs> I'm not going to sit there on a Saturday morning and watch a Hanna-Barbera cartoon. <laughs> <laughs> so I usually turn You were watching into... the competition is yeah, what you I, were doing. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I do, watch the competition. So <laughs> when these questions arise, arises at uh, groups like this, you know, I would be caught, uh, you know. <laughs> well, but you bring up a good point. Animation is voluminous. It, it is, there's so much that has to be done uh, from beginning to end. And the industry, going back to the early, early days of developing this as a, a viable industry, um, but the pace for television is even that much more consuming Features are going to take several years, but television is a much quicker, faster pace, yeah, faster yeah. turnaround mm -hmm. to meet those regular demands. Mm -hmm. Now, you wrapped out at Hanna-Barbera and then found your way back to Disney. You know, I actually went through animation burnout. <laughs> Because of the volumes of drawings you've yeah, got to do, right? I, I, you know, I, I did go back to what one new studio that started up during that period. I left Hanna Barbera to join Sanrio, which is known for Hello Kitty, and they set up a studio in Los Angeles or in Hollywood to uh, do a co-production with American animators and Japanese animators. And so I was part of that. And um, it was such a horrendous experience <laughs> <laughs> that uh, not, not, not uh, well, the, the product, the, our, our producer really didn't know what he was doing, unfortunately. I was production supervisor. So you had the American crew they would come in at eight o'clock and sit down and work. And at five, they sign out. The Japanese crew would come in around 10 and work boom, 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 until almost like 11 o'clock. And then now they're hungry. So we would have to call across the street to the uh, Japanese restaurant and then say, but we, we have our crew coming over, so they would have, have food ready for us. But the restaurant also had a lounge. And in the lounge was a young Japanese gal that played the piano. And this was before karaoke or karaoke bars, you know, you sang at the piano bar. And the Japanese artists love to just unwind, <laughs> come pie and, and start singing. And so I'm the production manager, so I'm, I, I'm staying with the crew from the American crew to the Japanese crew. And finally, finally, when we wrapped up the film, I says, that's it. You're done. I'm you, tired. You moved on to a different area. You returned to Disney and those of us who love our Disney fun and our consumer products, you were at the forefront of starting the Disney stores. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And just a taste of some of Willie's collectibles here in the image behind you. But you traveled uh, quite a bit, helping to establish uh, the, or the beginnings of the Disney stores, which yeah. mm -hmm. now that's all changing again. 
Uh, but you were a big part of that, making sure that the integrity of the characters, the look, keeping everything on model, um, creating new merchandise ideas, which yeah. was very pioneering at that point. Yeah, it was it was uh, quite a challenge. I, I I guess you might say I was one of the logical persons to be assigned to that because I myself was a collector. And so, you know, I had all these things in my collection and so the people at the studio of course were was aware of my collecting craziness and so doing this for the disney store was kind of a natural thing and when when we initially started the disney store our anchor store opened up in glendale in the los angeles area and with big fanfare, with the Disney characters like Disneyland walking around greeting the people and balloons and lights and all that, the customers all came in all excited and happy. And, and then as they were shopping, it dawned on them that these are same things that you can buy at Disneyland. At parks, yeah. <laughs> But it's and in your own backyard at yeah, this point. So we had to go it. back to the drawing board. Yeah, you reinvented that. But I, I want to move to make sure we can get our Q&A oh, in here okay. as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but there, you've been busy of late with a few other projects. Uh, this gentleman does not, he's not a lazy guy by any means. Um, you are always drawing. You are always at your drawing board. Uh, you're doing shows, speaking, getting out there. I think it's part of what keeps you so young. And you've worked with uh, your friend and colleague, Shug, uh, developing some story ideas. You've illustrated Hello, Maggie, which is your latest project. There are some copies still at the store you can get, and Willie will be here to sign and um take a look at that but that's also in production yes yes fortunately hello maggie found a niche and uh my benefactors actually it's a animation school in florence italy that uh, turned out to be he was a big fan of hannah barbera and so he knew of all of us and so consequently uh i was invited to visit them in Florence, Italy, and I found a copy of Hello, Maggie on his shelf. And I said, oh, hey, you got my book. He says, yeah, well, I got all of your artwork that's available, you know. And I'm thinking, well, sucker, <laughs> no. <laughs> but then, um, long story short, uh, I could never make a, a short story long or no, vice versa. No, you can't quite. So anyhow, <laughs> you're good uh, <laughs> at the... <laughs> uh, Hello, Maggie is now in production as a, as an animated uh, short subject. We started out 14 minutes. Then I received a wonderful grant from Heart Mountain, which is one of our other internment camps where my writing partner, Shig Yabu, was interned in. And um, they, uh, they want to see this happen. So they gave me a, a nice grant to encompass 40 minutes. But with our last Zoom meeting, they decided, let's, let's make it a 22 minute, which is a half hour format. So it could be bought by Netflix or Disney Plus or whatever. Gives it more viability in, in the uh, market these days. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. you're still you're still on the cutting edge of all of this. <laughs> I want to bring this up just to kind of wrap it out where we are with reparations um, in light of what the internment experience was. In 1988, the Civil Liberties Act was signed and there was a public apology for internment and reparations for survivors, but um, eight years after this was formed, uh, the CWRIC is formed and determined that you know, racial prejudice had indeed happened. Just literally weeks before the pandemic struck in California, um, 
literally to the to the day that FDR had signed the order into law for incarceration, the state of California apologized yeah. formally. Um, a long time in coming, and I know that these were this was all up and down the West Coast yeah. primarily. So certainly here in this region, up into uh, Vancouver and into Canada as well. Uh, so, but there still is it's it's a dark time in our history. It's important that we speak about it. We study. We know that this had in fact occurred, and uh, the timing to be able to. We are honored to be able to have you here to tell that story, oh, Willie, you. and yes. to know that you've taken your talents much further beyond. <laughs> I get a little well, clip sometimes. Got to make a living. <laughs> <laughs> and in doing so, you made a difference. So let's open it up to some questions. I want to ensure we had some time. Hello, and thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, Wondered if you could tell us a little bit about Hong Kong Fui and Scatman Crothers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, it, it um, because of the, uh, I guess you might say, the craze of uh, Jackie Chan and mm -hmm. all of that. Of course, the normal thing to do is to develop an animated show uh, with uh, martial arts and all that. And so, uh, and of course, the standard characters that we go for is dogs. Every <laughs> Hanna-Barbera series has got to have a dog. And so Hong Kong Fui was uh, just, you might say, a natural development uh, of uh, the series. But now the voicing, casting, well, casting yeah. Scatman Crothers is the voice. Yeah, actually, I was uh, 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 talking to uh, Pat Morita who later became the Karate Kid. Mm -hmm. And so I met with him and I said, would you be interested in, in uh, doing uh, or auditioning at that time for a voice? And he was. So we made an appointment for him to come that Monday and I waited and I never got a phone call or knew that he'd show up. So then the following Wednesday, I was at this Japanese restaurant and Pat was there. And so, I, hey, Pat, what happened? You know, I was waiting to hear from you. He said, yeah, my agent called and sent me over to Warner Brothers, uh, but I got the part. I said, yeah, what, uh, what part is that? He says, the lead in Karate Kid. That's <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> history. So you scrambled a bit and brought in Cap Scatman Crothers, which was a great yeah, choice. We, then another night, I happened to be at the Hollywood Bowl. That's not where the concerts are. It was a bowling alley. <laughs> <laughs> and in the bowling alley is a lounge. And so I was sitting there with a couple of my cohorts and uh, enjoying the evening. And there was this comedian on stage just cracking us up. And so when he took a break, I called him over and he sat with us and bought him a drink and we talked and I asked him if he might be interested in auditioning and uh, he says yeah so the next day I went to Mr. Barbera and I says hey I think I think this guy might be fun for a voice of Hong Kong Fui and so he cut an a audition tape I ran it by Joe Barbera he said hey that's that's a good voice so the rest is history. It was Scatman Brothers. Was and it one of his first animated voiceovers? Oh, I well, you had know, he done he, others prior? He, he's done a lot of since, things. but I this or was one of prior. his first. Yeah, you remember that Jack Nicholson movie about the crazy people? Well, in the, films. He had been in films, but yeah, I don't think films. he had done oh, animation. Okay. Oh, yeah, so yeah, he it may have launched been. a new new yeah. side of his career at that exactly. point. Yeah. Let's open to another question. Thank you. Uh, yes, you mentioned the, the voice actress named June. June, June Foray, yeah. Is she the one who did the voice of Rocky the Flying yes. Squirrel? She sure did. Exactly. She was also Natasha. And, and can I add something? <laughs> she has just been nominated for the yeah. June Foray Annie Awards. <laughs> yeah. As yeah. Thank you. <laughs> 
I'll be receiving that in uh, late late in February. Yeah. yeah. A tremendous honor. It's bestowed not for voice work. I don't do voice work. Yeah. But it's bestowed through the SIFA organization for individual uh, contributions that change the art form. And so my continued research and the work that I do in our women and other underrepresented groups in animation. Mm -hmm. I'm deeply honored. Thank you, Willie. That's sweet. Oh, well. Go ahead. Out of all the projects you worked on, who would you say was your favorite? <laughs> well, That's... because I was a big Mickey Mouse collector, people would assume that it was Mickey Mouse. No. And then because Dopey was my first inspiration, they would say, <laughs> hey, you know, it, maybe it's Dopey. And then working on Lady in the Tramp that be my initial break into the industry, would it be lady? And so now I, I kind of have to debate what is my favorite, but what keeps popping into my mind is J. Michigan Frog <laughs> from One Froggy Evening. Yeah. <laughs> it's a classic. That's a great one. Any other questions? Yeah. Sorry, I'm going to jump in real quick. Is there anybody that wants to ask a question and can't make it down here? Raise your yeah, hand. I think there may be a few over here. Okay. Well, I want to thank you both for coming, Mindy. Um, congratulations on the award. Thank you. I follow you very closely in your career, and I just oh. thank you for the beautiful book I have here. Oh, I hope you can sign it. And Willie, thank you so much. You. Um, you have created for so many of us characters that we grew up on. And thank you for the joyful childhood. Oh. <laughs> and also, um, I was a cast member at the Disney store, so thank you for oh, that. Oh, yeah, okay. Uh, and my husband would say you probably contributed to me being a hoarder of <laughs> definitely a lot of Disney uh, wonderful things. But I wanted to ask a question, and I say this with great joy. You both bring such a joy to your talk today where you point out the, um, the trials that we've gone through as a culture, but it speaks to today. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. I'm a big Charles Schultz fan with oh, Peanuts. Yeah. Yeah. And Charles Schultz brought Franklin yes. into a time of history in 1968 that was so important as you did with these important characters. But I was wondering if you could speak to that Charles Schultz was of a different race and brought forward Franklin as Walt Disney is, um, he brought forward wonderful opportunities for other cultures. Yeah. And we're seeing in our culture today where people are saying, that's misappropriation. You're not allowed because you're not of that culture. Um, I feel that it's beautiful that we bring, you know, you said it's not the color of your hair. That, you know, it's, it's the gifts we bring. Could you speak to that a little bit? Well, I think one of the uh, more recent upsetting things as far as I'm concerned is Disney has changed the Song of the South or the mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, the Ride. The ride, uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, uh, to retheme it. I saw no objection uh, myself with Song of the South. One of my uh, closest friends in animation happens to be African American. His name is Floyd Norman. Mm -hmm. Yeah, imagine. You all know. And he, he, is scratching his head himself. Why? Yeah. You know, sometimes you, you take uh, this kind of a movement too far. You know, we're all Americans and we appreciate and enjoy each other's ethnicity, culture, and all that. And so, you know, when you take cartoon uh, characters in, in a movie that was such a big hit, like Song of the South, you know, it, it, it just puzzles me, but I guess I guess that's how it goes. <laughs> I don't want to get political, so I'll just please do. <laughs> I think too. I, that, I, I oh. was fortunate enough to 
uh, enjoy Song of the South and on the screen. Yeah. And I really, uh, I'm, I'm, I, feel, I feel bad that my grandchildren cannot see such a thing. Yeah, it's, uh, it features it was such some a, of the such best a movement. animation. And oh, it's incredible. The, comb the combination animation of live action and, and animation and visually, musically, it's just a remarkable it, film. Um, quite an impression on me, for sure. Yeah. Uh, I have a couple of questions. Yeah. The, the internment camp where you are located, uh, can you be a little specific as to where that's located in, in Utah? Well, there's a little town called Delta in, in well, almost like around the middle of the state of Utah. And, of course, Salt Lake City is the main big uh, city close by where a lot of the interns not returning to California settled in, in Salt Lake City. So there's quite a community of Japanese Americans there, too. Now, geographically, I can't really remember exactly where, but history has it that it was all one time the Great Salt Lake. And of course, through centuries, the Salt Lake kind of shrunk down to what it is today. So when we would hike out to the desert and dig, we would find... Uh, white shells, you know, the uh, um, uh, all kind of uh, sea life fossils. And uh, so that was kind of interesting to find that in the middle of Utah. But I, apparently that's uh, what the uh, state was but at. You one. also make a sojourn. Um, usually there isn't there a, a Heart Mountain uh, sojourn that you do? Annually, or at least before the yeah, pandemic. Yeah, Heart Mountain is one of the uh, camps that have um, uh, really been developing and, and uh, with and fundraising yeah. and uh, government grants and all. And so uh, they're trying to um, recreate some of the barracks and some of the areas that survived, like Basically, what survived was the uh, your main concrete uh, flooring or whatever. Foundations so now, that, yeah, yeah, foundation. So they're trying to reconstruct the barracks and all that. And so every year they have what they call the uh, Heart Mountain Pilgrimage. Mm. And um, now there's not too many survivors but their offsprings and their kids and third and fourth generation, mm -hmm. they all go up there and pay tribute to what their grandparents went through and all. And so we have a camp in California called Manzanar. Mm -hmm. And Manzanar is another camp that's uh, frequently uh, visited by tourists because it's on the way to Mammoth Lakes and it's great fishing country, June Lake, and also that highway that passes going up there, they would see this guard tower. And they said, what the heck is that, you know? So then they would stop and then see the plaque. They said, oh my gosh, this is an internment camp. So then they would drive in, and they have a, a beautiful museum and uh, the whole bit, so, you know, uh, what what our future generations of kids are trying to do is trying to, um, uh, you, uh, you might say, what restore and try to keep to preserve the, the thing alive. Information. Yeah. I think it's important for future yeah. generations to know and to learn. Mm -hmm. We look to the past to enlighten the future, and I think that's what's important about your work and what we do through these kinds of programs to to educate and inform and enlighten from such a dark past to yeah. See, change the future. Exactly. And when Shiga and I first came up with doing the Hello Maggie book, that was way back in 2005. And he was a little persistent. We grew up together in San Francisco. And so I just retired from Disney after 50 years in the industry. I was tired. 
I broke you. all my pencils in half and threw them in the <laughs> trash. And then he called me and he says, uh, would you be interested in illustrating a book? I said, oh, shig. I just retired, you know. Yeah, leave me alone. <laughs> he was a little persistent. So I said, okay, Good. Shig, send me the manuscript, which he did. Then I, as I was reading, I said, oh, my gosh. This is about our incarceration days. Mm -hmm. But in a child-friendly manner. It's about a bird that he adopted and became a Maggie and, and the title, Hello Maggie, because Maggie would now ape or uh, uh, what's the word? Uh, well, copy, you know, languages. Uh, the, and because of the large Japanese population in camp, learned to say, Ohio, you know, and and, you know, Japanese words uh, along with hello, Maggie, and all that. So I thought, you know, this is a wonderful way to teach our grandkids and great-grandkids in a child-friendly manner what happened during our incarceration. So I said, okay, shit, I'm going to illustrate that. Because with my experience in a different camp, it was basically all the same. So that's how Hello Maggie came about. And it took all these years before, you know, it kind of caught on. But um, well, keep an eye out. There's a production underway, and hopefully we can keep things moving so that that'll be realized. Yeah, you know, it, Animation has a tendency to not only reflect, but also to sort of forecast where, you know, what's going on in our culture, if you look at it historically. Um, and we have an exciting array of animation unfolding that's now poised for Oscar consideration. And it's opening quite wide to a lot of independent studios. Major studios are there as well, but uh, there's so much great talent yeah, out yeah. there now. So those of you who are exploring, just kind of getting your fingers in the water with where you might want to take your careers, those of you who are beginning your schooling, um, take a look at animation. It turned out pretty good for this guy. <laughs> I'm having a lot of fun too. Any final questions? We can maybe take one or two more. We'll see how we're doing time-wise. Yeah. Hey, Ryan. Okay, so I'm kind of cheating because I already had the privilege of spending a half an hour on the phone with Willie the other day, but I kind of feel like this will be incomplete because we talked about, you know, as these, these cartoons are made for kids, but there are the jokes that are put in there for the grown-ups as well. It's, this lecture is not complete if we don't hear about how you guys managed to slip those in, uh, much to the network's chagrin. Well... Bob Clampett was one of the so-called rebellious directors. And uh, while he was at Warner Brothers, he did the, uh, 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 what was it, uh, uh, Snow Black and the- Coal Black, yeah. yeah. Coal Black, Coal Black and, the, and the, yeah. yeah. Things of that nature and, and the heavily caricatured uh, characters and all. And so when I was working with him at, on the Bean and Cecil show, ABC was very <laughs> strict uh, with their you know, uh, censorships mm -hmm. and all that because of the fact that it was a children's show and it was being aired during those hours. But Bob would slip things in and of course they would want to see the storyboards or a, a kind of a rough take of it. And then they would send a list. Bob, would you uh, eliminate this and, uh, and soften this and do whatever? And Bob would say, yeah, okay, no problem. Then he would sit on it. <laughs> then on Friday night, this is back before all the electronic uh, goodies, our production manager with the film under his arm would take the red eye and fly to New York and take it to the network. No time to change anything. They had to air it. <laughs> so all of these 
the so-called changes that the network requested <laughs> never got made. And I think that speaks to the point of why these stay with us, because we can still enjoy them as adults, right? Just a fun question uh, for yeah. both of you. Um, which of the seven dwarves do you like consider yourselves to be and why? <laughs> Uh, well, what was that question again? Which of the seven dwarves do you consider your? Do you identify with, and why? A dopey, of course. <laughs> <laughs> you have a good history of that. Uh, yeah, I I was attracted to uh, dopey when I first saw him on the screen. I I could never be a doc. Yeah. Uh, I'm e even tempered, so I could never be a grumpy, and maybe happy, but. Um, Dopey, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, for me, I was in um, the Snow, there was a Snow White uh, documentary that was done, and they sort of threw a curveball question to each of us they were interviewing about, okay, name the seven dwarves. And so I got them all except for, and, I, and I, I'm doing this big funny eye shift trying to think, did I get them all? And then they ended up using that portion. So I, ha I did get them all, but they took this moment where I uh -oh. stopped for a second to collect the names. I would say dopey or happy, one yeah. of the two. Yeah. <laughs> you have to be a little little dopey to be in this industry. And and I think if you're going to be in, in, uh, in the entertainment industry, the animation division side of it is probably one of the more happier places. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Great folks, great people. Yeah, and of course, even today, the, the new generations, I, I think yeah. when they see Snow White and the Seven Dwarf, and what a magnificent film that was. Masterpiece, yeah. And of course, Pinocchio is the other one that, yeah. uh, you know. And they really, have, it, those are films that transformed cinema overall. People forget with Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. It changed everything people thought watching animation for that long was going to hurt your eyes yeah there was, that was different technology thing, yeah. at the time that did cause some issues uh but you know walt really the, the care the work the risk that they took in making that film that's a whole other whole other evening we could put together but um it speaks to without the success of that film we wouldn't be here today Right, That's feature true. length animation. Someone else probably would have pursued it, but it really launched a large part of the Disney Studios, oh my the gosh, feature yeah. animation division, and you are part of that legacy, sir. And we are grateful for that. Oh, so, well, thank you. <laughs> with yes. that, may I say thanks on behalf of everyone for thank your you, artistry yes. and your you. time and your service. Thanks also to Kale, Ashley, and the great teams here at the museum. Please make sure you get a chance to get through that wonderful exhibition. It really is a rare treat. Um, you're seeing artwork that nobody has seen before, literally pieces that have come out of people's closets and under beds, but it has never been aggregated and curated into such a fascinating time period. And it was a perfect fit for this location. So please be sure to continue to visit as long as you can for the remaining weeks. We are so grateful to have been part of this experience with you all. Thank you so much. And please come linger. Willie's happy to sign your books. I've got some post uh, bookmarks for everyone. We're happy to sign and talk animation. Thanks so much for coming out on a rainy day. And we'll Thank you, guys. Later.